receive your mercy. Your faithfulness is clear to see. And it's constant every day. In the morning, in the morning you see. Like a sunrise, it's constant every day. And every breath I breathe, an invitation to believe you are creating something good. And though this season doesn't tell my story. I know you move mountains for me, and you're just that good, so I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough, cause he's more than enough, and he knows what I need. Silence, I choose to believe. You're working in the waiting, yes, you are. And though the future is in clear to see, no, I trust you. Stories. I know you move mountains for me, and you're just that good. So I'm giving thanks to God when I don't have enough, cause He's more than enough, and He knows what I need. Oh,
knows, he knows. I see you move, Lord. I see you move. I see. no way I see
mai, haere mai e te whānau, he mihi mata kui kui ki a koutou, e haere mai ki konei mō tēnei online service here with Dunedin Elam. Ko tēnei te wiki o te reo Māori, this is Language Week, and I wanted to welcome you in one of the official languages of our country, te reo Māori. Uh, and so I hope that you guys are able to have a really awesome day today. I hope you've had an incredible week hearing te reo Māori spoken, sung, or even reading it. Uh, and so this service, we are going to be connecting uh, with the Word of God in English. Uh, and that's going to be from Pastor Adam, so check that out. Kia ora koutou katoa. Hello and welcome. My name is Adam Dodds and it's great to be with you today. I'm the Senior Pastor of the Elam Church in Dunedin and I'm bringing part two of our series on the picture of a disciple. And let me just recap for those who missed uh, last week's uh, or for those who can't remember. So what I talked about last time was uh, this true story of a man who went to his pastor, this is in another country, and he said to him, you know what, I've been a Christian for 22 years. And then he said, but I realize I'm actually a one-year-old Christian who has just repeated the same year 22 times. And the truth that he's trying to communicate is maturity is not time served as a Christian. The truth is eternal life is free, but maturity is expensive. As the author Dallas Willard puts it, grace is opposed to earning, but it's not opposed to effort. And so the Holy Spirit's goal for you and for me and for everyone is to present all of us to God the Father fully mature in Christ. Colossians 1, 28. And then Jesus said something similar in Luke 6, verse 40, where Jesus said the disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And so those two scriptures raise the questions, what does it mean to be fully mature in Christ? What does it mean, what does it look like to be fully trained, to be like Jesus? And that's where the picture of a disciple document comes in. And we'll just show you an overview of it now. I introduced it last time, and this is the overview version. There's a detailed version as well that I've put on the Facebook Fano page, and you can access that for free. And the picture of a disciple describes in a little bit more detail what does every disciple, four things every disciple needs to know, needs to be, and needs to do. And so this series, we're looking at four things that every disciple needs to be. Last week, we looked at the fact that disciples love God, and we broke that down a little bit to say that disciples love God. How? By firstly being satisfied in God's love. Secondly, disciples delight in God. They serve out of delight, not duty. And then thirdly, disciples follow. They actually follow Jesus. And so that's what we talked about last time. Today, we are looking at the, the fruit of the Spirit. The, 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 the things that God calls us to be is to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And in the more detailed version, I explain a little bit about what that means and put a stack of scriptures next to them, which I won't go into now. But growing in the fruit of the Spirit happens in the context of relationships, especially loving people. It means growing in joy, growing in peace, growing in humility and being servant hearted. And so uh, the key passage for this is Galatians 5. Let me read to you from verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Beautiful, beautiful passage, and we're going to be unpacking that a little bit for the remainder of our time today. But let me first just talk about the importance of fruit. Why is this whole fruit thing important, and what does this metaphor mean anyway? Well, the truth is, is the day will come one day where God calls me to step down from being senior pastor of our church. And that may well be in 40 years time when I'm 80 years old, or it may be sooner. Who knows? I've got no idea. It's not, I, I don't know when it will be. I don't need to know when it will be. And it's not my business to know. Um, and so in that sense, I don't care deeply about that. But what I do care deeply about is this. As a church, I long for us to bear fruit for Jesus. We already do, but I long for that to happen more and more and more. And the thing that really gets me up in the morning, if you like, the, the, the vision that I feel like God has given me and placed on my heart, and the thing that I long to see happen is this. 
uh, a number of years ago when I was sharing the vision of our church uh, with our elders, uh, one of the elders' wives, uh, she, uh, Auntie Hilda, had a picture for my, my wife and I, uh, Kylie and I, and the picture was of us sitting under a tree and the tree was dripping with fruit, just fruit absolutely everywhere. And then there was a sense of Kylie and I looking back at the tree with fruit just everywhere and we said to each other, we did it. We did it. Obviously, by the grace of God, we did it. And, and so that's the thing that I long to see is to actually achieve all that God has for us as a church family. And I know we got a way to go, but it's exciting that we are on the way. What's the big deal of fruit? Well, Jesus talks about it in John 15. Let me read to you from verses 8 and 16. Jesus says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Why? So that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Well, okay, so there's a lot of talk about fruit. John 15, Galatians 5, plenty of other places too. What does it mean? Fruit is simply this. It is manifesting the life of God in how we relate to each other. It's manifesting the, the life of God in our lives and in our relationships. And so the beauty of what God called us, has called us to be as a church is this, that we are called to be a community who display God's transforming power, who display his life in who we are and what we do. It's a beautiful picture. It brings glory to God the Father, and we are going to get there by the grace of God. So with that in mind, let me get into our content for today around the fruit of the Spirit. The disciples are those who grow in the fruit of the Spirit. And so as I talk about this, let me talk about three contrasts. External um, constraint versus internal constraint. External conformity versus internal conformity. And then lastly, of the externals and internals, the external expression of an internal reality. So I, I see in Galatians 5 in this concept of fruit of the Spirit, a series of contrasts between external and internal. Let's jump into the first one of those, external and internal constraint. I don't know if you can remember back to your time when you were at school. I can remember back to my time at school. And I remember one person, um, there was more than one, but I remember one person um, I knew I didn't know him well, but I knew who he was, and I'd spoken to him a few times at least. And I remember him getting expelled from the school for doing things he shouldn't be doing. In other words, what my school had to do is enforce external discipline on him, uh, enforce external constraint on him, uh, because he lacked internal constraint in terms of the things that he was doing. And, and what I see here in Galatians 5 that Paul's talking about, this discussion of the fruit of the Spirit comes in the context of external constraints and internal constraints. And, and Paul's contrasting the fruit of the Spirit with the law. And the law represents the 613 commands found in the Old Testament, the most famous of which, of course, are the Ten Commandments. You'll be familiar with them, I'm sure. Do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not murder, and so on and so on. And, and like like these laws, all laws act as a form of external constraint to keep behavior within certain boundaries. Now that's from the Bible, but actually most religions have a version or a form of external constraint. Um, in Islam, Sharia law is largely a system of duties of external obligations. In Buddhism, there is the Eightfold Path, which again provides that external constraint. And then there are many non-religious versions of this as well, particularly within the self-help movement. Um, consider Professor Jordan Peterson's best-selling book from a couple of years ago, 12 Rules for Life. It's largely a list of do's and don'ts. It's largely a list of rules to follow, which provides a form of external constraint. Now, in all of these different groupings of rules and laws and do's and don'ts, there may be some truth in all of them, quite possibly. But the one thing that all of them lack is this. They lack the power to transform on the inside. That they can provide external constraint, but they can't provide internal constraint. 
Now, the Old Testament law differs from all of these other ones in, in several ways, one of which is the Old Testament law is true. It's God's word. It comes from him. Um, but another thing that the, ex, uh, that the Old Testament law does wonderfully is it shows that external constraint is not enough. We need internal constraint as well. And so yeah, the last of the Ten Commandments says this in Deuteronomy 5.21, you must not covet that is, desire something which belongs to somebody else as if you would, you would then take it for yourself. So what's interesting about this do not is it's actually not so much about external behavior, but it's actually about internal desire. And so what God is saying through this commandment in the Old Testament is, is actually external constraint is important for sure, but we need internal constraint. We need internal transformation as well. The only issue is the Old Testament law doesn't provide the power to make that happen. But Paul in, in this passage in Galatians 5 explains precisely where we get that power from. And so we have the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22 and 23. And then immediately following, Paul gives us the explanation of where does this power come from for the internal constraint, the changing of our desires from within. And he says this in verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, that is the sinful nature, with its passions and desires. Now, crucified, very strong language. For our purposes, what it really means is it decisively put to death. So our, our sinful nature has been decisively put to death with its sinful passions and desires. I think what Paul's trying to say here to the church in Galatia and to us today is we don't crucify, we don't kill, we don't put to death our own sinful desires. Rather, we recognize that when we gave our lives to Jesus, that's what happened then, that on the cross, these things were killed once and for all. And when we became a Christian and gave our lives to Jesus, we identified with the death of Jesus. And that death then became true in our life as well. And that's why Paul says earlier in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Not I need to keep on being crucified with Christ. I have been once and for all. It's a done deal. And so Christians have said an absolute unconditional no to all of their sinful desires and passions. That's a Bible scholar Walter Hansen. And so here in verse 24, Paul is reminding us and reminding the church in Galatia that they've already done this, but our job is to then outwork this in practice, that renunciation of evil is a practical everyday discipline. Internal constraint is an outworking of the internal reality that we have been crucified with Christ, that we've decisively said no to our own way and yes to following him. And so what does this mean? Well, it means that when I'm on the computer and I'm looking up whatever it is, I'm looking up doing some research or something and a pornographic image jumps up on the screen as it does sometimes. What it means is that I exercise internal constraint and say, no, I will not click on that. I will not go for the clickbait, but I'll actually keep choosing God in that moment where temptation jumps at me in the face. Or when I'm tempted to be really rude to someone, maybe they've just cut me off with their driving or something like that. I have to shout a defiant no to my sinful nature that wants to kind of go rah or something like that. And go, actually, no, I, I died to that way of living. I died to the right to behave in that manner. You know, when I'm criticized unfairly and my sinful nature wants to lash out verbally, I have to just stop and say, no, I, I died to that way of operating. I don't live that way anymore. I already died to that. I now have to remind myself of that truth that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. What am I doing in those moments? I'm applying an internal constraint. And that internal constraint is not just willpower, it is empowered by the fact that I have been crucified with Christ. Empowered by what Jesus has done for me once and for all, and me putting my faith in him and following him. So you have this contrast, the law provides external constraint, but Jesus provides internal constraint. That's the first of our contrasts, let's move to the second. External conformity and internal conformity. So Jesus calls us to internal constraint, dying to our sinful passions and desires. Um, but he also calls us to inward conformity, 
which is rather than taking away the negative, it's desiring the positive. It's actually wanting to do God's will. It's desiring to do the good, not because we have to, not because someone tells us to, but because we're actually moved from inside to want to do it. Let me ask this question. Is it right to constrain ourselves internally? Is it right to seek internal change where our desires actually change so they become conformed to the will of Jesus. Is that right? A popular movie that I'm sure some of you have watched uh, is called High School Musical. In fact, there's a series of movies. Um, But the first one, uh, one of the key characters is a guy called Troy Bolton, and he wants to be a singer. And of course, High School Musical is about these extremely talented singers, and he is one of those. Uh, And of course, he happens to be popular and good looking, and you know how these movies go, and, and that's how it goes in this case too. The problem is, is that he loves singing. He wants to be a singer, but his dad wants him to be a basketball player. And so what do you do? And, and of course, he's good at basketball as well. I mean, I, these movies seem to portray people who are just perfect in every way, but you know what I mean. And so he has this internal battle. What does he do? Does he pursue his heart's desire, which is singing, or does he pursue being a basketball player, which he's really good at as well? And, and actually, a lot of the movie is an inward wrestling of who am I really? What is my inner wiring? What is my true inner desire? And then I need to act in accordance with that. In other words, I'm wrestling over who I truly am. You may have noticed that the theme of many movies and many TV shows is this. Be who you truly are. You know, turn your back. And and, and the idea there is when you discover who you truly are on the inside, to turn your back on that to choose something else is almost the ultimate betrayal. It's almost the unforgivable sin. And our culture seems to say that our inner desires are good and they can be trusted and we can act on them and we need to be true to who we are on the inside and embrace those feelings. And so how does all of that work when I've just been talking about internal constraint and and those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful passions and desires? What that seems to say, according to Galatians 5.24, is not all my desires on the inside are actually good. Not all my desires on the inside are actually from God. How do those two narratives line up? The one that I've just described in the Bible, but the other one that's so popular in our culture that we can trust that which is on the inside. And in fact, to go against that is the ultimate form of betrayal. There's a clash here in terms of what is true and what is not. And how are we to live? Is it right to constrain ourselves internally? Is it right to seek internal conformity to Jesus' will? And then if it is right, second question, if it's right, how do we then do that? How do we grow in internal conformity to the will of Jesus? Well, as a Christian, and I'm sure this is true perhaps of you, whether you call yourself a Christian or not, I know that I have thoughts and I have desires pretty frequently that are not good, that are not God-honoring, and I don't think they actually reflect who I am either. I think some of my desires reflect my history, some of my desires reflect my destiny, but a whole bunch of them are not necessarily honoring to God or anybody else. And what I want to submit to you is what is inside of you and what is inside of me is a mixed bag. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there, some really good stuff and some other stuff that kind of ain't so good as well. And, and, and it is true that I think God has put certain callings and giftings into people's lives. I do think that's true. It's what I would call who they are in their heart, who they are in terms of their hard wiring. And, and that reflects who God has created them to be. You know, I love the story of, of Eric um, Liddell, uh, the, the runner. And he talked, you know, he just loved to run. And, and he came alive when he was sprinting, when he was running. And he said that when I run, I feel, I sense God's pleasure. And what he's saying is, I'm just kind of hardwired this way. It's part of who I am. And and when I embrace that, I honor God in the process and I love it too. And I want to say yes and amen to that. That is right. And you see it in children. You know, as I say, all kids come out of the garage differently. Sorry for the crude analogy. But you know, some kids... They just love to draw and they're just drawing all the time. Other kids hate drawing. You know, some kids love to create things and, and, and other things create other kids create different things and some kids just can't stop singing and it just appears God's made them to love singing. Others just want to play sport all the time and others love to study and others really don't like studying at all and 
and, and others are incredibly social and are really people people, if you like. And what you find, particularly with kids, before other layers of life have been put on top of them, is you can see aspects of who they truly are, of who God has made them to be. It's beautiful. But I think that there are also parts of our inner worlds that are not necessarily those things God has put in there. And, and this, of course, is how advertising or marketing works. Things can enter our minds and hearts on the short term because of advertising. You know, if I say to you Big Mac, cheeseburger, double down, zinger, quarter pounder, and then you just start thinking of burger fuel and you start thinking of Velvet Burger in Dunedin and you start thinking of um, the amazing burger place in Queenstown, uh, um, Ferg Burger and, and your burger, 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 or oh, cheeseburger, double cheeseburger, chicken burger, you know, just, and then if you see images and you're bombarded with images all of the time, sooner or later you're going to say, hey, I feel like a burger. Now that desire has come from inside of you. But where did it come from? It was put there by somebody else. That's how advertising works. That the movie Inception is all about this. And it's a brilliant movie. Um, and so all, all of that to say, so there are some desires that come on the inside of us that have been deliberately put there that are not necessarily a reflection of who we are, of who you are. On a more sinister note, uh, I've heard um, more than once of people who are struggling with dark and quite violent thoughts. And it's not necessarily because they're violent people or even dark, in, that's not their normal mode of operating. And it turns out actually it was largely because of the TV that they were watching, that they were watching TV shows that had these themes over and over and over again. And it was coming out in their thoughts, it was coming out in their dreams, it was coming out in all kinds of ways. And, and when they realized that that was the case and they stopped uh, the input, they stopped exposing themselves to that, those themes on TV, within a period of time, those things disappeared from the inside of them. Now, this is a full on story, but, you know, as a church, we're about being real and being authentic and people struggle with lots of stuff. And I just read very recently of someone, um, this is not in our country, but I just read of someone who had a sex addiction and they acted compulsively. At the time, they thought their desires were healthy. They, they, they would have said it's just a part of who I am. And they would have denied that those desires were a problem. But they were undergoing counseling for other things. And as they went through this counseling process over an extended period of time, they actually discovered some horrible childhood experiences. And as this person worked through some difficult traumas, as they worked through um, grieving, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and a whole bunch of the other tools that counselors have, and we thank the Lord for them, uh, they're a means of healing. This person got to a place where they'd experienced a significant healing from the past. And, and what they found as a consequence of that was their sex addiction had gone. Their desires in relation to in that, in that sphere had significantly changed. They hadn't set out at the start to change that part of who they were, but it was a consequence of some other stuff that they went through in life. And it, and it just says to me that there's all kinds of reasons why we can have thoughts and desires on the inside of us that can have nothing to do with who God made us to be or who we truly are on the inside. You know, I know of another story where someone, um, he was uh, training to be a medical doctor. If you asked him, you know, one year, two year, three year, four year, five years, over an extended period of time, what do you want to be? I want to be a medical doctor. And so he was training to be a medical doctor and then he, he succeeded. He actually became a medical doctor. And after a period of time, he then realized, I'm actually living somebody else's dream. I don't want to be a medical doctor. And, and he realized over a period of time that that dream was put there by his parents rather than his own dreams, his own desires. And it's true that we can act on desires that we think are ours, but actually they come from somewhere else. All of that to say this. The point is, is that desires on the inside of us may actually have nothing to do, some of them, not all of them, some of them may have nothing to do with who God has made us to be, of who you or I truly am, who you truly are. They may have nothing to do with our authentic selves, if you want to use that kind of language. And yet, some of our internal desires totally reveal and reflect who God has created us to be. And so given that's the case, then 
The only question is, there's got to be some kind of sifting, some kind of mechanism, some kind of purification system where all of those different things that are jumbled up on the inside of us can be sifted out. And the stuff that is true and the stuff that comes from God and the stuff that does reflect a hard wiring can remain while the other stuff can be purified out over time. Well, the Christian is the one who has been crucified with Christ, who has crucified their sinful nature with their passions and desires. The Christian is the one who denies self, takes up cross and follows Jesus. And in following Jesus, we do what he says. And what does he say? Well, he says many things. But one of the things, and in a key verse in this passage is Galatians 5, 13, where Paul talks about serving one another humbly out of love. Because we love, we serve. Now, in my experience, there's two kinds of people. Um, there are two kinds of people who serve. There are one kind of people who serve because they just love to serve. They get it. It's part of who they are. And they just they, they recognize how important other people are. And they just want to get on with it. And, and to them, I just want to say, I honor you, good on you, that is awesome, and I mean it. Then there's another kind of person who serves, and I would probably put myself in this category. And, and, and maybe you're like me, I don't know. We serve because we know we should. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily mean we actually want to. And so uh, I remember a time years and years ago, part of this church, and there was a need, someone put a call out, or I was asked, I can't remember, to be someone who counted money. We do things differently now, but back then we had people who came up during the service in small teams, and we would count all the money, um, and then we'd record everything that was given, and then put it somewhere safe, uh, and then that was the end of our duty, and then we would go down and carry on. And so I was part of the counting team. I didn't do it because I liked it. I didn't do it because I felt called to it. I didn't do it because I felt particularly gifted uh, in that area. I certainly didn't do it because I thought my destiny is in this. You know, I do think as Christians, we can over-spiritualize some stuff, eh? I did it because I knew that Christians serve. This was a need, therefore that's what I do. But I did it out of a discipline, not out of a delight. I did it because I, I, I was happy to help. And, and as Galatians 5.13 says, serve one another humbly in love. And so I did. Um, and, and it's, it's kind of like, if you were to ask me, Adam, would you rather not do it? I probably would have said, yeah, probably rather not. What that translates to, and I know nobody would ever say this. I know that. But what it kind of translates to is, you know, I don't really want to serve cups of tea for other people, but I happily would have other people serve me. And what, you know, I don't really want to serve other people by opening the door and, and welcoming people, but I want someone else to do that for me. And, and what nobody says, no one would say this, and I wouldn't say this either, but underneath that, at least for me, I think, is this thing of, I think I'm more important than other people. I, I, I think other people should serve me, but I don't really want to serve them. And, and again, no one would say that because that sounds shocking and it's clearly not true. And, and, and so... <laughs> When we're in that situation, what do you do? And I think where you start with is Philippians 2 verse 3, which it says, consider one another um, more important than yourselves. Consider one another as better than yourselves. And so you start serving because Jesus tells you to, not because you necessarily want to. Want to. But here's what's really cool. As you persist in doing the will of Jesus, what I'm talking about now is serving one another. As you persist in that over time, you start to change you start to realize this is actually a real honor. This is a real honor that I get to serve others. Man, what a privilege. And then you start to realize, oh my goodness, I'm actually becoming more like Jesus as I do this. You know, Jesus said that I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus said that in Matthew 20, verse 28. And so as we serve, we're literally becoming more like Jesus. What a privilege. And then as you keep serving even more, you start to realize, Oh my goodness, I was wrong. I, for some stupid reason, I used to think that I was more important than other people. But now I realize, look how important these people are. They're created in God's image. Jesus died for them. He's filled them with his spirit. He's given them every spiritual blessing in Christ. And they're just the Christians, the ones that, the, 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 that don't know Jesus. Oh my goodness, they are so precious in his sight. What an honor that I get to serve them. Oh my goodness. And the beauty of it is, is as we follow Jesus, he changes our desires from the inside out. 
I love First Peter one twenty two in my uh, personal Bible study. I'm working through First Peter at the moment, and I came across chapter one verse twenty two, which says, "Now that you have get this word." purified yourselves how by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for one another love one another deeply from the heart you start with philippians 2 3 consider one consider one another better than yourselves but then you get to a place where you realize it's actually an honor to do this and by obeying god by doing what he tells us to do we've actually become purified in the process and our desires have changed on the inside So bringing these strands together, internal constraint, holding back the bad, if you like, uh, the the sinful nature and sinful desires, and internal conformity, though the putting in of the good, where we actually desire what God wants. No one has to tell us to. We want to do it. It's our privilege. When this process is repeated over time, whether it's to do with serving or anything else, what you find is this is what happens. Our desires get sifted, our desires get purified, and some of the stuff that's impure gets strained out bit by bit, one by one, and Christ is formed in us. The desires that are not of God start to fall away, and new desires emerge. And it's beautiful. Internal transformation takes place. It's the fruit of the Spirit, the life of God emerging inside of us. Galatians 5.17 puts it this way, the Spirit gives us desires. The Spirit gives us desires. This is sanctification. This is becoming more like Jesus. This is growing in the fruit of the Spirit. Let me give you the the full verses there. Galatians 5.16 and 17. So I say to you, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature, nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite to what the sinful nature desires. The third and final contrast, external expression of internal reality. I remember reading many years ago about this guy called Nicky Cruz. Nicky Cruz was a gang member in New York, uh, a violent man who um, ended up doing all kinds of horrible things by his own account. Um, And then he gets encountered by this preacher by the name of David Wilkerson. And there's famous books written about this. Uh, Run Baby Run and The Cross and the Switchblade and others as well. And there's this really interesting encounter where David Wilkerson is trying to share the love of Jesus with this hardened gang leader. And at one point, Nicky Cruz gets so frustrated and so angry that he verbally lashes out and he pulls out a knife and he said, I could cut you into a thousand pieces right now. And David Wilkerson responds. And if you did, each one of those pieces would cry out, Jesus loves you. And that story has always stuck with me. It's just so beautiful because, you know, when you're in a situation like this, when when, when your back up is against the wall, there's no pretending, there's no hiding. Who you truly are comes out at that moment. And in that moment, David Wilkerson had probably already thought through this could happen. And he'd already prayed it through. And in that moment, who he was came out. And who he was was... I'm a messenger of Jesus. I'm a son of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I love you. And this is is what I'm about. And if that's what you want to do, you so be it. But this is the truth. The fruit of the Spirit is like that. It's so conforming us on the inside that, that who we are just naturally comes out. There's no pretense. It's completely authentic in every way. So what is the fruit of the Spirit? What is fruit? It is the outward characteristics of inward character. It is the visible characteristics of invisible character. It is the invisible life of God made visible in you and me. It is the invisible life of God made visible in you and me. Well, I've talked about inward character. Whose character? Well, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. It's actually a description of God's character, love, joy, peace, and so on. And one Bible scholar puts it this way, the spirit will produce those moral qualities that God requires. It's not a to-do list that we have to try really hard on. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. But as we grow in the fruit of the spirit, we become people who display the life of God 
toward one another and in our world because it's who we are. Final question. What do a people look like who are growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Who are we as Elam Dunedin? And what will we look like as we continue to grow, as I know we will, in the fruit of the Spirit? We will serve one another humbly in love. We will be good at resolving conflict. Why? Conflict is human, but resolving it with maturity is Christian because egos don't get in the way because we're about humility. What will be like? we be like as a people? We will feed the poor. We will serve the poor. Why? Because they are on God's heart. And as he works his life in us, they put, God puts them on our heart too. We look out for the needs of others. And finally, there will be a lot of joy, a lot of peace, and a lot of laughter. There'll just be this this lightness of spirit because we enjoy one another and we enjoy the life of God in us. That is what honors God. And isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? It's a picture of God's kingdom. And so I'd love to pray for you and pray for me now that we would grow in the fruit of the spirit toward one another. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that this is your desire. This is your dream for our church, but Lord, for all people everywhere. But it's our privilege, Lord, that because we know you, Lord Jesus, we now want to say yes to you again. Lord, we recognize, Lord, that we have died to where our old selves have been crucified with Christ and and we have died to those sinful passions and desires. And Lord, we desire greater internal constraint, but also greater internal conformity. Lord, that you would birth yourself in us. Holy Spirit, that you would put your desires in us and that we would indeed become more like Jesus, not just individually, but collectively together as a whole. Lord, we we thank you that this is not a to-do list that we have to work really hard on ourselves. But Lord, this is something you will work in us as we follow you. And so do that, we ask. And do it, Lord, not only so that you get glorified and not only so that we get great pleasure and delight and joy in living this way, but Lord, that, that we might then bring the life of God to others, especially the last and the least and the lost. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The world I know Trying to fill A burning desire But they'll never find enough gold Many are searching for fame New things, they're always decay Man's empty praise Will fade away your love will remain I'd rather give you all the glory I'd rather give you all my praise for your love and grace your goodness and mercy you follow me all of my days many are looking to heaven Lives that were lost are in you But Jesus you spoken And the curse is now broken And all of the praise goes to you I'd rather give you all the glory I'd rather give you all my praise For your love
We do not give to earn love, but we give because we love. We give because Jesus first gave to us. Uh, giving can be financially, it can be of our time, it can be of our energies. In Te Reo Māori, we have a whakatauki that says he aroha puta, oh, he aroha whakato, he aroha he puts on mai. So the love that you put out, that you sow, uh, reaps a harvest of love. And so we want to give you an opportunity this morning to give financially. Uh, so if you want to give, you can give via our website. Um, but if you're in a position uh, financially where that's not possible, kei that's okay. Uh, find other ways to give uh, to the to the whānau around you. Uh, and so we want to encourage you. Uh, if you want to give, you can give via our website at www.elamdunedin forward slash giving. Miharo kotene te wafakamutinga. This is the end of our service. I wanted to uh, encourage you with a little fakatoki we're learning this week in our hot household. It is tohaina o painga ki te a, which means share your gifts with the world. Uh, what are we required to do according to what God asks of us? He says, do the next thing he's asking of you. And so what is that next thing for you? Maybe it looks like connecting with a group of people. We call those small groups here at our church and we'd love for you to get connected with a small group. So get in touch with us via our website or here in the comment section in order to get connected to a small group of people so that you can do life with others. Maybe this morning you learn something about Jesus that you've never heard before and it's that's really exciting to you I want to encourage you get in touch with us as well uh, we want to journey this journey of faith with you you do not have to journey it alone you're not encouraged to journey it alone this is something that you can do in Fano. Uh, so definitely get in touch with us uh, or it's a certain point that is drawn out of the message that has really stuck with you maybe you should do that uh, whatever it is I encourage you let's be people of action who uh, do what we're called to and who share our gifts with the world. I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a blessing. Kato, kato katoa. Te ata fai o tato ariki ko i hukuraiti. Me te aroha o te atua. Me te fifinga tahi tanga ki te wairua tapu. Amen.